Welcome to Supernatural Circumstances, the podcast where we take you down the rabbit hole into the fascinating world of the strange, the paranormal, and the unknown. I'm Morgan Knutson. And I'm Mike Brown. It's time to dim the lights and settle in. Come along with us on this week's adventure. Oh boy, so we're talking to Travis Watson again. I'm, I'm really glad. I like Travis a lot. I do too, and I think this is such a neat conversation because we get to take a look at cryptids in a brand new way. And mm-hmm. I love that. I love when there's a new angle on something that's been around for a really long time. So yeah, describe the angle a little bit for our listeners before we get into discussing it. Yeah, so the big question I think that has been on a lot of people's minds in regards to this subject is where is the line between the paranormal and the spiritual and the physical? Mm -hmm. And somehow there's been a line that's been drawn right down the center and you have to be either on one side or the other side. And I think what people are forgetting is that everything in this world is kind of on a continuum between spiritual and physical. We are part spiritual and we are physical. And it's not really an either or thing. So what Travis is proposing, which I think is really fascinating, is where is Bigfoot, Sasquatch, on that continuum? Is he more on one side and leaning to the other? And that's what the discussion is about, which I think is is a really interesting and unique way to look at this. Yeah, really. Um, I mean, this gets right into the whole uh, interesting (laughs) question about quantum physics, really. Uh, What what is it? What is it that's happening in this world um, is, you know, it, it's right down to that double slit experiment. Is light a wave or a particle? Well, it depends on if you're not looking at it, then it's a wave. But if you're if you're looking at it, it's a particle. So <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's all related somehow to to that kind of thing. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And And I think we have to start to change the way we examine and look at the world around us. You know, mm. we're, we're so focused on the idea of, well, this is solid because I can see it and taste it and touch it. But we know scientifically that that's simply not true. Right. You know, just because something looks like it's solid doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, the way it is has actually formed together. So I, I think if we can take the equation and break it up a little bit, this idea that it's either one way or it's another way, Mm -hmm. then we can start to have a new discussion about these really interesting and bizarre sightings that people are, that people are having with these really odd components to them, like following a a trail of, of Bigfoot tracks and then seeing them disappear in the middle of the field. Right. It's weird. It is weird. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is why I got into this sort of stuff in the first place. It's just, uh, <laughs> you know, questions. I have questions. I have some big questions. You think we all have some big questions? Well, let's talk to Travis and let's hopefully at least open the door to more of them. Right. And that's the thing. We, we I don't think we ever really find answers. We just find more questions. Hey, but maybe the questions will be a little bit more advanced by the time we're done. So let's do this. Okay. Okay, so I am really excited about this conversation, as I am about all conversations, but this is a conversation that I've wanted to have for a really long time, like I would say the last six months or so. Uh, And Travis, we're so glad that you're here because I think this this is the first brand new angle to me uh, in regards to some of this cryptid research that has been explored a little bit, but not explored in my opinion, enough. So thank you so much for coming today. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, It's a pleasure to be back on Supernatural Circumstances. And, uh, you know, just wanted to to say hi to everybody before we get started here. Um, You know, I start the book off. Well, first of all, let's back up. First of all, the book is called The Forest Poltergeist. (laughs) And it's it's about uh, Class B Encounters. Um, what the uh, BFRO calls Class B encounters, where people 
uh, come across disturbances in the forest that are attributed generally to Sasquatch. Um, I had occasion, uh, not back when I was uh, doing the, the marketing for um, Sasquatch Canada, which was my last book, um, to speak with a podcaster um, who proposed the idea that if we took all of this stuff that, that people were reporting out in, in the wilderness and we um, put that all of those events into a house, we'd have a poltergeist case. Um, and this individual and some other folks that uh, – or you know, your listeners would probably recognize have been discussing this, and they kind of dubbed it the wilderness poltergeist, and I didn't want to step on their toes. But uh, when I started talking to them about doing this book, they were all like, yeah, yeah, better you than me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I'll, I'll get into why that is here in just a minute. Uh, so, you know, not wanting to interfere with other people's stuff, I, I redubbed the phenomena, the poltergeist, so, the forest poltergeist, and, and that is the title of the book. Um, this was, yeah, I mean, you guys have talked to me about some of my other books. Uh, we talked about Mysteries in the Mist not too long ago, and mm -hmm. I believe we talked about Sasquatch Canada. Yeah, most of my books follow a pretty standard format. You know, it's like, Look, there's all this weird stuff out there. Look at all the weird stuff. Um, isn't this cool? <laughs> and I'll give you case cases of all the all the interesting things that that I've tracked down over the course of my research and whatever the topic is. Right? This this um, this book's a little different. Um, this book is is maybe just a little bit more of a think piece. Um, there are certainly cases um, involved, but. As I started doing the research on this, I realized why those folks that I was talking about were, you know, better you than me. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the things, one of the things that you find when you start to do research into the poltergeist phenomena, is that there are dozens, literally dozens, of rabbit holes to go down. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you can get lost in. In all kinds of, of of esoteric research, when you when you start looking into this phenomena, um, and my purpose when when I write a book, um, this is something that I've probably said before, but it bears repeating. I want to give the reader a good introduction to whatever topic it is I'm discussing, provide them with some good background information give them a good bibliography so that they can go off and jump down the rabbit holes themselves. Um, and so I strive to be really concise uh, in my, uh, with my, with my books. I try not to write two volume sets, um, which I could have easily done with, you know, Sasquatch Canada, with this book, with <laughs> Mysteries in the Mist, with, uh, you yeah, know, with any of my books. My, my goal is to try and get the ideas out there and let people run with them. Um, and that's what I tried to do with this book. And I probably, you know, some people are going to accuse me of being too concise because um, I didn't incorporate dozens and dozens and dozens of cases. Um, my reason for that is pretty simple. I didn't want my book to end up being, being like one of those, Victor those massive Victorian tomes that goes on and on and on, <laughs> yeah. and on with pretty much the same stuff over and over again while they're trying to prove a point. I, I love, yeah, I love that. And I, and I think, but I, I think, you know, you, you, you presented it really well. I mean, I got to read it. It was, it's, it's really good. It's everybody out there. It's, this is a really interesting piece, whether you agree, disagree, whatever, this will is absolutely it? start making you think. And so for, Everybody out there, we're we're talking and and focusing on this idea of class B encounters. Can you like summarize that really quick for everybody so they sure, know what that is? Sure. Yeah. Um. You know, and that was one of the things that that you know I jumped on at the very beginning of the book is if you don't know what a class B encounter is, you're not going to have any idea what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. So 
If, if you go into the various um, Sasquatch sites, whether it's uh, you know the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization or some of the the smaller groups that uh, that do research, they've kind of um, on on that particular phenomena, they've kind of done a um, a grading system. So they have a Class A encounter where somebody actually visual, visually sights a Sasquatch. There's a whole you know, for those of you who are interested in Canadian stuff, there's a whole ton of Class A Sasquatch encounters in Sasquatch Canada, which is my last book. I focused on that because that was what I wanted to, to do. You know, I wanted to actually present cases where people had seen a Sasquatch, um, whatever that is. Um, when we talk about Class B encounters, though, <clears throat> we start to get into a fuzzy area. The traditional, rat, uh, the traditional Sasquatch researcher will tell you that there are certain signs that there are that these creatures are in the area, and those signs can include things like rock throwing, uh, wood knocks. You know, anybody who's who's sat and, and watched any of the the you know the Bigfoot type uh, television shows knows about wood knocks, right? Um, vocalizations. Uh, various kinds of vocalizations that are not uh, easily identifiable. Um, what some people call tree structures, which are kind of a loosey-goosey category of, you know, whatever this is, altering its environment, making making little sculptures in the trees or whatever. Um, you know, so in other words, these are... Um, Situations where people, oh, oh, and tracks, of course, um, sorry. Um, so these are situations where people are um, finding or encountering or experiencing these phenomena, you know, the wood knocks and the rock throwing and so forth, but they're not actually seeing a Sasquatch. Another very common one is bipedal footsteps um, that you hear a lot. Um, you know, and all of these things, you know, again, <clears throat> and one of the things that, that I'm probably going to be accused of after writing this book is being completely on the woo side um, and, and you know, uh, not thinking that, that Sasquatch isn't an actual creature or, you know, physical, physical being. Um, at no point do I say that. Um, I am perfectly happy to accept that there might be, you know, a large bipedal primate wandering the the wilderness areas of of North America. I mean, it's possible. I mean, they found a coelacanth in, in you know in you know off the, the coast of Africa that's supposed to have been extinct for sixty million years. I mean, <clears throat> okay, um, I don't discount that possibility, particularly in a place like Canada that's got tens of thousands of square miles of of wilderness area that's barely touched by human beings, be an ideal place for an unknown species to live. But when you start to look at the the sighting reports, even you realize that these creatures are being seen all over the place. I mean, you know, if you if you look at, for instance, BFRO database. These creatures are supposedly being encountered, being actually seen, Class A seen, in every state in the United States except for uh, Hawaii, as well as all, you know, when I did my research, I encountered Sasquatch reports from all over, uh, from every province in Canada except for none of it. Um, didn't find any there, but I'm not convinced that there aren't any there, just that nobody reported. <laughs> well, and you take it in a different direction, like, it, you know, where I think everybody or, or not, I shouldn't say everybody, because there's, there's a number of researchers out there who are, are proposing this as well. But um, when we're talking about the idea of of poltergeist, how are because poltergeist has got a number of different terminologies in, in parapsychology. Sure. In, in this book, how are you defining poltergeist? Well, let me just back up for for just a second and, and finish that first thought. You know, sure. So these creatures so, are being reported all over the place, right? And if we are talking about tonight. a rare, rare bipedal, bipedal primate that 
values its privacy, apparently. You know, I mean, there's all those joke T-shirts about Sasquatch being the world's hide-and-seek champion. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> then, you know, it seems to me that we have to start looking at other explanations for the Sasquatch sightings and particularly for these gla- Class B encounters. So one of the things that, you know, as I said, has been proposed is that some of some or maybe even all, who knows, uh, of these Class B encounters, these rock throwing incidents, the wood knocks and all of the fun things that we hear about in Sasquatch lore, um, some of these are actually uh, coming from what we could call poltergeist phenomena. Now, in parapsychology, a poltergeist is, the German actually means a noisy spirit or noisy ghost. Um, And it is a particular type of, and I'm going to use the word haunting advisedly, (laughs) because it's really about the only word we have for, for what this is, right? It is a type of haunting that is characterized by uh, very active physical phenomena uh, happening. In other words, you know, you don't just have, you know, spooky apparitions wandering through the house or cold spots or, um, you know, uh, electromagnetic fluctuations, lights flickering and that kind of stuff. The sorts of things that you see in your typical ghost hunt, right? You also have very physical phenomena and those phenomena can have a hugely wide range uh, when you start to get into the, uh, to the actual case studies of, uh, of poltergeist phenomena. But probably sure. And often the most, a human agent. And we'll get to that in a minute. They have a huge range, but probably the, um, the most um, well-known uh, aspect of, of poltergeist phenomena is this idea of things moving in the house. Um, there's there's one uh, case in the book where uh, uh, it was an older case, and I don't remember. I think it was in the UK, um, where the the uh, the person who was being plagued by this particular poltergeist had actually uh, was bringing their crockery, all of their glassware and stuff, out of their house in a bucket because it had all been shattered. It had all been thrown <laughs> against the walls and oh, shattered. No. Right? Oh, boy. They had like three or four buckets full of crockery that, oh. that, that broke it. Um, you know, so these these manifestations, whatever they are, these ener- energetic, you know, anomalies um, that we call poltergeists are, um, are frequently um, known for their destructive tendencies, but also for their, their desire to sort of alter their environment, which is something I'll get into in a minute. Now, you mentioned the idea of a human focus, Um, and it's very common in parapsychological lore um, for, uh, you know, for the parapsychologists, whether it's William Roll or or Lloyd Auerbach or any of those guys, to actually look for uh, what they call a focus in uh, in a poltergeist case. Um, This person is very frequently a younger person. Often, uh, you know, a child on on the on the brink of, of puberty, um, but they can be almost anybody. Um, there have been poltergeist cases where the focus was actually more of a middle aged person. Um, the suspicion uh, amongst parapsychologists who don't want to assign a, a a spirit origin to the idea of poltergeist, which is something I disagree with, um, but the the uh, the I. The uh, idea in their research is that this person, this focus, is actually causing uh, what they call RSPK, which is random spontaneous psychokinesis uh, activity in the house because that person is in one way or the other repressing emotions, uh, typically violent emotions, and those emotions are having an outlet through this psychic phenomenon. Uh, which is causing you know things to get shattered and things to move around and and all that sort of thing. Uh, Lloyd Auerbach calls it having a psychic t- temper tantrum. So, um, <clears throat> so that's what we're talking about when when we're talking about a poltergeist. Um, and there is certainly a um, a human component both to the poltergeist phenomena and to the Sasquatch phenomena because. You don't have 
a witness. You don't have any kind of anything to report if there's not a witness, right? Um, so there's going to be a person there, uh, whether they're having a class B experience or whether they're having that class A visual sighting experience. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's certainly the case that there is a human element to both the Sasquatch and the poltergeist phenomena. Um, but obviously, you know, Morgan, you've read the book, you know, that's not all I think that it is. <laughs> well, sure. And I mean, and I think what, what throws people about this, this idea in general is that, is that this, when, when people see them, it is 100% something physical. And I think, I think when people think of a haunting or something like that, they think of two things. They think of, okay, well, what, what is it then that is, that is creating the haunting? What am I looking at if, if I'm seeing this, this, you know, apparition or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and B, what then is this, like, what, what then is this app apparition? If I'm, if I'm seeing something very physical, if I'm seeing something very solid, what's going on? And, and like, I've got a couple of thoughts about that, but I'm really curious to see about, uh, to see what, what your thoughts are about the idea of, okay, if this is some sort of entity or, or spirit or something like that, then, you know, why are people seeing the great big hairy man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, yeah it, it, and one of the things that, that, uh, that you discover about me from reading my books and talking to me is that I never, ever just believe that there is one explanation for something. Sure. You know, when we're talking about the great big hairy guy, hey, there could be a great big hairy guy out there. I don't know. I mean, I, I again, you know, there is the possibility, particularly in remote wilderness areas, that there is an actual unknown species out there. If somebody reeled in, uh, you know, uh, you know, came in with a Sasquatch body tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised. But what I would be, what I would be is go, what I would be doing is saying, okay, that's great. That accounts for some of the stuff that's going on out there, but it sure doesn't account for all of it. Um, so when we start to talk about more, you know, esoteric explanations for, for Sasquatch, first of all, let's talk about this idea of apparitions, um, you know, a lot of people think that an apparition is like this smoky, hazy, you know, ooh, you know, spooky thing, you know, that you have in haunted houses or, you know, haunted cemeteries or whatever. It's the white lady wandering along in the mist, right? But if you actually look at uh, the, you know, the classic uh, Tyrrell book on apparitions, for instance, a lot of those things... People will wake up in the night and have somebody standing at the foot of their bed, and they're mm -hmm. positive that that's an actual person that they're looking at, but it's an apparition. So, you know, there's no reason why some of the sightings that we have out there might not be uh, apparitions of some, you know, spiritual type entity, you know, mm -hmm. that's just appearing to somebody as, you know, hey, look, I'm a giant hairy ape. Uh, two-legged, you know, upright, bipedal hairy ape. Um, and I talk a little bit about that at the end of the book, too. Um, there's also this idea, which is one that I favor because it comes from, uh, you know, the indigenous side of the, of the, uh, of the argument. For instance, uh, the late, great Linda Godfrey talks about, uh, in a couple of her books, this idea from the Ho-Chunk tribe that Sasquatch is actually a spiritual entity that has the capability of walking between worlds. And when it comes into our world, it has a physical presence. Mm -hmm. Which is the same in Canada. The The First Nations have the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just, I'm using that as an example. That is not an uncommon thought in mm. First Nations uh, lore. Um, you know, some of the tribes see Sasquatch as just another animal that lives in the woods. Um, some, some tend to see them as, as, uh, you know, a, a, a separate people that live in the woods. And then some have a lot more, uh, mystical kind of idea of, of the Sasquatch being a being that normally lives on the other side, but that has the ability to step through and main and actually assume a physical form. Um, 
you know, now a lot of people are like, oh yeah, that's, that's a great way to explain things, you know, explain a mystery with a mystery, but it's like, okay, that would sure explain a lot of the issues that we have around Sasquatch research. Like why hasn't anybody ever bought one in? Um, why is there any good, you know, other than maybe the Patterson Gimlin film and a few others, there's just not a lot of good video or pictures of a Sasquatch. No. You know, you know, why do we have these reports that pop up every once in a while where Sasquatch just disappears in front of somebody? Um, there's there's a couple of those in, in Sasquatch Canada. Um, the classic one that I always think of is the one from Stan Gordon's book, um, uh, one of the one of the Pennsylvania books, uh, where this lady's watching TV and she hears uh, she hears a, um, a sound out on the porch. And she's been having trouble with feral dogs in the neighborhood, so she gets her shotgun and she <laughs> opens the front door, and walks out onto the porch, and when she flips the light on, she's standing face to face with a seven foot Sasquatch. Um, now, the Sasquatch throws its hands up in the air like it's surprised and she thinks she's being attacked so she blasts the thing with a shotgun (laughs) it disappears in a flash of light now that is not what ordinarily happens with physical creatures you know right normally fall down you know that's you know you, you shoot something with a shotgun it normally bleeds and falls down um so you know that's that's a a classic example. There's also Sasquatch Canada. There's there's a story of a native fellow who's driving along uh, uh, the road, and uh, I think it was near Yellowknife, um, and he sees a Sasquatch on the side of the road, walking along close to the power lines. Um, you know, his people, of course, believe that these creatures exist, so he's not utterly astonished. But of course, he slows down to watch this thing, and as he's watching the Sasquatch it becomes more and more transparent and just fades from view. That's not something that a, that a physical creature can do. <laughs> do you think that there's, that maybe there's a, a chance that something like this could become very physical and non-physical in the same breath? And I ask, I ask this because there's been so many reports over the years and, and people coming forward and and saying exactly the opposite where you know they have shot at it and you know a, a young one was killed or something like that and then the you know the parents come in and taken the body and taken off into the woods or whatnot and it's i mean upsetting like i, I hate these case those cases because they're just absolutely heartbreaking um but yet you like you were saying you hear about the the flip side to this where you know, people are following tracks and then the tracks get to the middle of a field and disappear. Um, so there seems to be this this balance. And I know in um, in uh, Alaska, uh, where Sasquatch is a very, very common thing, um, there's a, a belief there that I've been told over the years of, of these, these, these entities sort of being some type of mammal, some type of great ape, but they've got this ability somehow. And I mean, I, I I don't know how this would work or whatever, but have some sort of ability almost to withdraw into itself um, to, you know, I don't know, like just to, to disappear. I don't know. Like it's, uh, you know, and I'm not proclaiming that this makes any sense from a biological (laughs) perspective because it doesn't, but that's the, that's the, the belief of a lot of the, the, the people, uh, like the first nations and stuff in Alaska is that, is that they, they've got the ability to be, have this physical presence. And then if they want to, you know, dissipate and disappear, they can do that. It's, it's just something I'm kind of throwing out there. You know, so you mentioned the idea that there have been people who've opened fire on these things and actually claim to have killed one. And, and I have mm-hmm. a story like that. And I have a story like that in South Watch, Canada. The interesting thing to note here is that nobody's ever bought a body back. No, you know that they, they, you know, and and I'm not um, disputing the fact that you know this person may have fired on a Sasquatch and may have thought that they actually bought one down, but uh, you know either the hairy people are cleaning up really well, um, or you know after a certain point, if you leave a Sasquatch body long enough, it dissipates. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Because nobody ever finds the body. You know, they shoot the thing and then, you know, they get freaked out and they run off and then they come back and there's nothing there. Um, 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, now your idea of the Sasquatch being physical and non-physical at the same time, um, if we're talking about a creature that is actually capable of walking between worlds, then it is physical and non-physical at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are any number of stories, too, where people have opened fire on a Sasquatch and it had, or a dog man, for that, for that matter, and had absolutely no effect. Even though they're they're certain that they hit it, um, and they hit it with something like a deer rifle, so it should make some kind of impression, right? Um, so, you know, then we we get into the whole slippery slope of you know, is it real? Is it not real? Is it physical? Is it not physical? And my answer to all those questions is yes, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. because. I think that we have to, and this is something that I'm, I'm stressing throughout the book, is that we have to get out of the silos. You know, we have to start looking at the Sasquatch phenomena, you know, through other lenses. You know, and and I'm suggesting in the book that this particular, this is a particular lens that we can look at that. That these class B encounters, the rock throwing and the, the wood knocks and all those kinds of things, can just as easily be explained by you know a poltergeist type force in in the forest as they can by you know a giant wood ape throwing rocks and stones at people and, mm -hmm. and you know and hitting hitting trees, um, because we see in the poltergeist cases examples of that exact behavior happening in poltergeist cases. Yeah, and, and this is what the book's all about. You know, I mean, stone throwing is a a a classic mark of a poltergeist case. Yeah, like we see it in the Bo Borley Rectory, and those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been a number a number of classic cases. You see it in Enfield. You see it in uh, in the Black Monk case that I talk about, where the guy gets beamed in the head with uh, with a, a Lego, which was as close to a stone as the poltergeist could find at the time. Right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I quote from a, a um, from Guy Lyon Playfair who who wrote the the This Is Haunted book on the Enfield Poltergeist. He's mm -hmm. talking about you know uh, distinctive marks of the Poltergeist case, and he tells a story of a fella who uh, took a, a girl who was a focus in a Poltergeist case into his home. Um, he was a spiritist and and he was interested in the phenomena and he wanted to see what would happen. His house got showered with stones, and he actually had a count of the number of stones that that in ended up hitting his homes, 300 and something. Yeah. I mean, somebody would have to be really determined to spend that much time throwing rocks at somebody's house and be really good at hiding themselves not to be discovered. Well, it's an interesting concept, too, because if you've got a house, like if, if you took, for example, that house and you know, made that a cabin in the woods and then mm -hmm. said, you know, the house was pelted with rocks. What, how? Yeah, that context would change, right? It's the Ape Canyon incident, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sasquatches yeah. are throwing big rocks at people's houses. It's like, well, we saw this too in the uh, in the Monster Quest episode called Sasquatch Attacks. I mean, they go out there, they're, you know, they've got, the, you know, they're looking at DNA off of this, this bear trap thing that they put in front of the door and they're, they're, you know, trying to, to get some kind of response from, from Sasquatches by doing all this different stuff, right? The last night they're there, somebody, and they don't show this on the show, of course. This is, I get this from uh, having listened to interviews uh, with uh, D Doug Haychick, who's, who's the guy who, who put that together. Somebody went out on the front porch to, to urinate. And uh, while they're standing out there, a rock comes sailing across and pangs into the into the metal roof. And of course, you know, he, he goes running back in the house and says, hey, there's somebody out there throwing rocks at me. Um, and, and they, you know, the rest of the crew comes out and they've got this great, uh, you know, uh, sequence in, in the show where, you know, there's these rocks coming and they're hitting the roof. And all of the people in this group suddenly are terrified and run back into the cabin. And they're all sitting around quietly in the dark with their, their cameras going, there's something going on out there. And there's one poor lone schmuck who's gotten stuck outside with, you know, like the infrared and, and, and the night vision camera and stuff, who's trying to find whatever it is that's throwing stones out in the forest. And of course he 
gets out. He has absolutely no luck. Um, it's just hilarious if, if you're, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for the people who were involved in that show. You know, Jeff Meldrum was on, there were a couple of other biologist types, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I have a great deal of respect for Dr. Meldrum. He's, he's, you know, he's the guy who keeps me believing that there might be a physical animal out there too. Him and, and uh, in uh, Washington, we've got, you know, the Olympic Project, Derek Randall's and, and his, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and their research, you know, and, and they've, I mean, I, I think they're of the mind that this is a, a, a physical phenomenon and whatnot. And they, they bring up some interesting points. Like I think, um, and I we had this conversation, Mike, with uh, with Ken Gerhard right. last year in the first, yeah, and not about Bigfoot. We were talking about um, Dogman yeah. in the sense that there are these adaptive qualities that both the Sasquatch and Dogman both seem to have, like one being uh, fur color. Like fur color doesn't change unless the the something's evolved to have a, a certain amount of fur, like certain fur colored to to blend in and work with the environment around it. Um, things like following migration patterns, like the the fact that, that you know Bigfoot seems to follow elk herd migration patterns, especially in Canada, you see that that, that quite frequently. It varies. So there seems it varies, and it and it. I find that very, very interesting where, you know, with, with typical poltergeist phenomenon, you usually, you don't usually see it wander like Mm -hmm. that, you know, where normally it's, it's something that is either related to the, the, the individual or it's related to a certain location, but it just to throw a a new idea out, out there, um, do you think that there is even a, maybe a possibility that you've got a, a creature or something that is capable of poltergeist phenomenon, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit because um, we, you know, we talked a little bit about the human connection with with poltergeist activity, and, and I think that's pretty sound. I mean, they've over the years they've, and I've I've wrote a book about this myself where they it's it's tied to our, our emotional centers, um, but in the same sense, you you've got researchers like Ron Moorhead, for instance, that have said there seems to be an element of things like infrasound here as well, which I find really fascinating because when he was doing his research and his studies, um, he was noticing, and and this has been, ties into this sort of non-physical air about all of this phenomenon, is that people, when these things come around, there's almost like this horrific sense of dread, which these you know different frequencies can can absolutely start to affect our emotions we know infrared or infrasound can do that um uh in uh in in alaska it's often said if you hear bigfoot's whistle that it can disorient you um and things like that and they they definitely believe in that as well which is which is really fascinating and and ron who we're having on uh, later this year is is going to be talking about that too um but yeah i i just i i kind of wonder if that maybe there's you know, it, it, it's not necessarily one thing or another thing. But if if people are are able to project the movement of phenomenon, then what if maybe these things are able to do something very similar? And that could be an interesting take on it as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm familiar with the with the idea of infrasound, and that's that's one of the uh, things that that some of the more flesh and blood researchers try to use to explain these disappearance cases. You know, oh, well, Sasquatch muddled their mind and then walked away, right? Mm-hmm. Eh, that may explain some of these cases, but not all of them. Um, one of the things that that I think sort of argues maybe a little bit against that idea is that why? Um, why would Sasquatch or a dog man or whatever evolve these biological adaptations that basically turn it into a superhero. The infrasound question, though, is easily answered by looking at other animals, right? That's an apex predator thing. Well, and not only that, but it's also a good way of projecting if, like, if you don't want somebody around, like, because here's, so here's what I know about a lot of negative entities that that, that do this. And it's not necessarily infrasound, but they tend to do this. And when, People don't want to be, don't, if they don't want people in a certain space, you get this horrific feeling. And it's usually accompanied very similarly with with signs of Bigfoot, where you get the horrific smells, you know, the 
biting, the rock throwing, the so on and so forth. Like you get all of those things with with negative entities as well. But I mean, I think the idea of adaptation, I mean, it's to me, it's it's relatively obvious. Like, I mean, if you don't want somebody around, what's a better way than making them terrified? Mm. You know, they're going to they're going to book it and take off. And and a lot of animals use infrasound for communication. Mm-hmm. Elephants do that. Yeah, elephants absolutely. So I mean, so I, I think it's I think it's viable. Like whether we're talking about an entity or something physical, I think either either way, I think you could justify the infrasound argument. But again, you know, my my thinking is, yeah, again, you may have a a highly adapted bipedal primate um, that is responsible for some of of you know the sightings that we have, some of the class B encounter stuff that we have, um, you know. This being, you know, I mean, it is a large, it, if if it is a physical being, it is a large apex predator. Um, so there's no reason why it wouldn't have infrasound capabilities like a tiger, for instance, or an elephant. Um, and that certainly could account for some of the feelings of dread and, uh, you know, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the general, you know, I want to get out of here kind of feeling that a lot of people have when they encounter Sasquatch, right? Um you know, my argument though is that that particular critter is probably fairly rare. Um, you know, and so I think that we have to look outside of the physical realm uh, to account for some of this, uh, some of this activity that we're seeing. The fact is, you know, you're talking about the stone throwing, we're talking about the wood knocks, we're talking about tracks, vocalizations, all those things. All of those things can be found in poltergeist cases too, <laughs> you know, and which is the point of a point of this this whole book. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I agree with you. I think that um, you know it's entirely possible that we do have a bipedal primate of some kind that's that's got some pretty interesting capabilities, which have allowed it to hide. Um, I can't see that that you know that creature is so. Um, common though that it's you know that we're seeing it all 40 49 can 49 states everything but hawaii and then um, and then all the provinces in canada i mean that would make it so widespread and common that it's you know it, somebody would almost be bound to stumble over a body in the forest or you know actually actually kill one and bring it in or uh, you know capture one or something well and i think that's where the question is 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 then where is it i think that that ultimately is the big question is 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 where is it and i mean i've i've never i've never seen a big i think i've heard one um there's a a location here in alberta where I, a couple of friends of mine and i are pretty sure we we heard one but uh and the the usually the the, the sightings there are, are relatively high. And I used to be a 100% this is something completely physical person. Like that was, like I was, I was, I was on that, that page for a really, really long time. And it wasn't until I started, yeah. And it wasn't until I started having the experiences that I had with Dogman that it really started to shift where I was on this subject. And, and, one of the reasons why was that there was there was a couple of sightings that I had here uh, of one of the dogmen here in Alberta that was absolutely 100% solid. Like if I had have reached my arm out the window, I would have patted this guy. Like he was, it was absolutely a, somebody standing there. And yet I, not long later, we were, we were out on, on one of these, these trails or whatever. And we saw one and we ended up catching part of this on camera of this thing bursting into what I can only say is like polony smoke. And it was the strangest thing. And we caught the burst of, of smoke on the camera. We didn't catch the dog man, but we caught this like this burst of smoke on the camera as this thing went up. And it was just the craziest thing. But as I say, you know, a few hours before that, I mean, this was broad daylight. We saw him in broad daylight. I was probably, oh, hell, 20 feet from them. And I mean, you'd swear to God that this thing was absolutely 100% physical. And so I, I, this this idea that we've got this, uh, you know, I think that we're, people are, are always trying to stick things into like, is this physical or is this non-physical when I, I really think we have a spectrum. Well, yeah, I think it's both. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, you know, 
you're talking about the dog man, but you know, we can we can generalize this over to Sasquatch too. You know, the idea is that when these beings, you know, and, and you find this in occult and esoteric lore too. Um, you know, I talk about, uh, for instance, you know, Dion Fortune's uh, encounter with a, a thought form that was actually solid laying next to her on the bed. Um, when these things come from one side to the other, um, the theory is that they're gathering etheric uh, matter to them and they are assuming a physical form. So if you walked up to this dog man and, and, and he would allow it, you could pat him and you would think that he was as physical as you or I. But he also has the capability of going in a puff of smoke, you know, when he's ready to return to wherever it is he came from. Um, yeah, and, and people think I'm a little nuts for thinking he's like this, but, you know, there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, evidence, particularly from, you know, you know, magical practitioners, for instance, who have encounters with beings that come from that side. And some of those beings become very physical. Yeah. And, and, you know, have a physical effect on their environment. Um, so, you know, I mean, who's to say, uh, there are, you know, more things that are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. You know? right. mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, yeah, there. It's entirely possible that we have a bipedal primate that has extraordinary capabilities that is really good at hiding from people that exists in the wilderness areas of North America. But I think you also have, you know, and I talk about this extensively in the book. Um, you know, all of those things that have been attributed to being signs of Sasquatch's presence there. You know, the rock throwing, the wood knocks, the uh, the tracks, the vocalizations, and all, all of those things, if you if you step outside of the silo of Sasquatch research, you can find in poltergeist cases, including tracks. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's not not unheard of for for tracks to be found in, in poltergeist cases or or even in haunting cases. It used to be a uh, a fairly common ghost hunting technique to put flour on the floor. Uh, looking for footprints, you know, and those things are actually found. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we have to alter our mindset such that we can accept that um, we're surrounded by all kinds of weirdness. You know, we exist in this vast pool of energy, you know, from which arises all kinds of things that some of which, you know, seem to be as physical as the chair that I'm sitting on. Um, some of which seem to be more ephemeral, like some of the apparitions that people see, and some of which are are in the middle. So, you know, the 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 idea of physicality, I think we have to start to move on to uh, a spectrum, you know, where something is more or less physical, and not, you know, this is physical and this doesn't exist because it's not physical. Um, we really have to to um, allow our minds to be more flexible about these things when we're looking at, uh, particularly when we're looking at th this kind of stuff, because, you know, I mean, it's a mystery. It seems like this conversation that we're having is one that we have, no matter the topic we are presenting on this show, it's, it's if we're talking about aliens, if we're talking about ghosts, if we're talking about dogmen, now we're talking about uh, Sasquatch in the same way. There's some really strange things happening, I Hi. think, uh, uh, around thought. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. and, sure. And how people are perceiving things now. That it's It seems like in every regard uh, in this area, that this broad spectrum of things that Morgan and I talk about, we are really starting to, all these things are starting to converge into one thing. It's really fascinating. And, and Mike, that's exactly my point in the book, is that we need to step out of the silos. 
You know, mm-hmm. everybody's like, okay, well, I'm a Sasquatch researcher. That's what I do. I do Sasquatch, right? right. And then there's yeah. UFO researchers and they do UFOs and that's all they do. And there are ghost hunters and they do ghosts and that's all they do. And there are, you know, the, so everybody lives in their little silo. And what needs to happen is we need to blow the silos up so that we can look at these phenomena from a 10,000 foot level and say, hey, there's a lot of similarity between this yep. thing and that thing. Totally. You, know, it, you, know, you look at something like Keel's Mothman prophecies. You know, you had all these UFOs zipping up and down the river and all this mm-hmm. wild stuff going on, right? And there's the Mothman thing happening. And there's all this, and there's tons of explanations why that could be happening, including, you know, like juxtapositions of ley lines and, and all that kind of fun stuff that you wouldn't think about. If you're stuck on, you know, aliens are, or, you know, UFOs are flown by these little ET guys who are, you know, they're little right. gray dudes and, and they're flying around. They come from other galaxies, right? Um, right. If you're stuck on that or if you're stuck on, you know, Mothman was the Sandhill Crane or whatever, or, you know, he was some kind of weird, you know, extraterrestrial bee or whatever. Yeah. You know, if we're stuck on having the explanation, you know, with capital letters, then we can't back away and say, hey, look at all of this weird stuff that happens out there. And what does this have to do with this thing and that thing? And, you know, you know, when you start to look at these Sasquatch cases where the, the footprints disappear into the, um, uh, you know, in the cornfield, then you realize that, hey, maybe we should start asking Sasquatch experiencers if they've ever had any other kind of strange encounter. And, Almost invariably, you'll find out, oh, yeah, you know, well, you know, I live in a haunted house or, or, um, you know, yeah, I saw these weird lights in the woods before I had this encounter or, yeah, there's, there's all this stuff out there. Um, but because people are in their silo, they're not getting all of it. You're right. Yeah. They're like, I'm not interested in your weird lights. I want to hear about the Sasquatch. <laughs> I'm trying to be a renaissance freak, you know, like. <laughs> totally. I, I don't want to hear about the UFO the Sasquatch came out of. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. want to hear about the Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or I don't want to hear that there are Sasquatches coming out of UFOs because I want to hear about the aliens. Yeah. Right. So it, it's it, it's self-defeating, though. That kind of attitude is self-defeating because if you can't open your mind to all of the different possibilities that are out there, you miss all the fun as far as I'm concerned. Cause I, I mean, I just, I love this stuff and I love this stuff precisely because it's just so weird and you can't put it in a box. <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Like, and it, I, you know, and I've, I've said this a number of times on the show where, you know, I was, I was similarly like that until I, I started investigating a couple of different, a couple of different weirder things in in Alberta. You know, one being uh, Dogman, and it was it was so vastly life changing for me because it was something that I was seeing. You know, I could carefully photograph. But <laughs> very, if you were really sneaky about it, um, you could. You know, you were. I was hearing them, seeing them, seeing the evidence, the physical evidence of them. Um, you know, all things that were very clear, everything that was happening was repeatable. Like it was absolutely, it it was mind blowing. And yet, you know, you're, you're looking at something and thinking this shouldn't even exist. This doesn't make sense biologically. You know, these, these, I mean, something like, like a dog man, I mean, there's no way in evolutionary history, (laughs) this guy should be here. And yet it's like, you know, here, here it is. So where did he come from? If, If he, if he's not from here than where and I, then, you know it then you get that there's that question right where you get to this this point and you're seeing them do things that seem i mean to us it seems very magical but at, at the same time you're going man i know nothing about this world <laughs> like zero <laughs> yeah, things exactly. like there was yeah exactly. like there was a couple of moments i'm telling you especially last year there was a couple of moments where uh, it, it was it, like I would just I would walk away from an experience and go, uh, well, I thought I knew things, and no, mm-hmm. no, nope, but I know nothing. Nope. I know I nothing. I know nothing. nothing. <laughs> yep. So now it's like I tell you when people come forward and they're just like, you know what, this blank, this is what I saw. So you know, and whatever, and it can be the weirdest damn thing, and I'm like, sure, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Th- then you get into the whole concept of perception too. It's like, oh, absolutely. My spouse and I constantly disagree on simple things like, oh, well, that thing is blue. No, 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 that's the green. Mm-hmm. You know, if if my perception is that different from their perception, then on something that simple, I mean, you know, it just you know, it, it, you start to think about human perception and it just blows wide open, right? Because mm-hmm. you know, my reality is not the same as your reality. You might be looking at a dog band, and I could be looking at something completely different. Totally, for all I know. Yeah, my brain may be in. You know, I, I'm convinced that some of this is is we're encountering energies that we're not familiar with, and our brain is trying to translate. You know, and so it's using the werewolf, uh, you know, thing for for dog man, and it's using the wild man thing. Uh, what do you call? Um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, almost like a almost like a framework. Uh, uh, framework. Uh, uh, Carl Jung archetype. It's using the wild man archetype for, you know, for to, to translate and you get Sasquatch or, you know, it's using some other, you know, weird thing to, to translate to, to make a mothman or whatever. You know, in my translation of that energy may be completely different from somebody else's translation of that energy. I've talked about this on the show before. When I was a kid, I had this experience when I was laying in bed of something standing near the bed. And the way I described it was this thing had Spider-Man eyes because that was the that was the thing that I had in my head at the time, right? You know, later on I I I uh have I've begun to think maybe that was something a little different, but my child brain uh, projected Spider-Man into that situation, if that makes mm-hmm. any sense. Sure, it absolutely makes sense. I talk about, too, you know, just to, to really throw, you know, another set of dice into the mix. I talk about at the end of the book, what if, you know, there is a type of spiritual entity that we could call a trickster, that delights in messing with people by posing as a Sasquatch, you know, and doing all of these strange things, you know, uh, rattling around in the forest and throwing rocks at people and doing all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, when you get out of the silo, when you get away from the, oh, well, Sasquatch must be a, an unknown bipedal primate and we must, you know, approach this scientifically and do all of this stuff and, you know, try to get, uh, you know, DNA samples and hopefully we can get a test ses- specimen at some point. You know, that's great, you know, as far as it goes, but it's never going to solve the mystery. The mystery is always going to be there. And so, you know, my my thought on that is to just enjoy it. You know, you know, enjoy it and look at all of the different things that it could be. And, and you know, you know, explore the different theories. You know, I talk about how, you know, the forest poltergeist, as I've dubbed it, could be fairies. You know, I mean, as easy as anything, we are, we know from the lore that there is a race of beings, other world beings that we have had steady interaction with for millennia. You know, and we know that a lot of the things that are attributed to them are also things that you find in a tr- in a class B encounter or a poltergeist encounter, for that matter. You know, so hey, it could be fairies. <laughs> you know, I love that idea myself. I I want it to be fairies. I think that would be cool. I'm okay with fairies, but you know, yeah, this me is too. yeah. This has been such an interesting discussion, and I think uh, this is what I love about about doing this show is that. You know, we we get to throw these these brand new ideas on the table and let people just hash them out. And I think what you've done with the book, I think really, I think it adds to that discussion. I think you've you've you brought up some really interesting ideas. And before we wrap up, let people know where where can they grab this so that they can they can go down this rabbit hole with you. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, you know, uh, the force the title of the book is Force Poltergeist. Um, I publish under, you know, my my own name. It's W. T. Watson, 
And uh, the book is freely available on Amazon. Um, you can get a paperback copy if you like. Uh, it's available on Kindle. And, you know, if you're one of those people who does Kindle Unlimited like I do, um, you know, you can even read it for free. All, all, all of that stuff uh, benefits me. And, you know, the thing that I ask everybody is, you know, if you read the book, you like the book, please leave a review. Um, it does authors a world of good uh, when you do that really does help it helps us to to keep going sometimes because sometimes you think you're shouting into the void uh, right but yeah <laughs> it's so true <laughs> it, is, it is available on amazon and all of its various permutations so um feel free to pick up a copy we you know i enjoyed writing it and i hope that people enjoy reading it Oh, I know they will. I mean, it it is it's it's so it's it's so well written, and it's it's so much fun to read through it, and just your imagination goes wild, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as you as you're going through all this stuff. It's it's so neat. So, Travis, thank you so much for being here today and and hanging out with us and just dragging us down this rabbit hole with you because it was so much fun. Oh, and we didn't uh, even get down all the rabbit holes that we right? could have gone down. <laughs> no. it's, it's like, <laughs> Do we ever? The, the no. Bo- the book is full of rabbit holes. I'll put it that way. So, uh, you know, again, like I said, you know, look at the bibliography and things that pique your interest. You know, be be free to ex- explore because that's that's why I do this. And wow, uh, another great conversation with Travis. What? He's he's always got so much for us. I just, I'm just like, uh, okay, and now I go away and, and I, I, I fall down rabbit holes with, you know, the books that he's written or things that we've just talked about. And uh, oh, my goodness gracious, my head's going to explode one of the day, these days, I'm sure. Uh, I, I agree. It's It's so... It's so unique the the ideas that he's putting forward because it it's really challenging people on a number of levels and I think one of the one of the ways it's challenging people that they might not like is is the fact that it's it's reshaping our paradigm of how we understand what we're viewing and mm-hmm. what we're seeing mm-hmm. um, which is really it can be really really difficult like you've got to be able to sit back and say well, okay well what if, what if Mm-hmm. Um, and it reminds me of our conversation recently with with Chris Albeck right. is challenging those stories that we're telling ourselves that we think we understand and know, and we have to start challenging those stories. And I think that's what Travis is doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the, I I have a lot of people in my life who fall squarely into the this is a material thing camp, uh, and you know. Maybe it's a bear that people are seeing somewhere. You know, there's there's no there's no such thing as anything that is unknown. Yeah. So uh, it's a hundred percent explainable if you just look at the evidence. And yeah. Uh, well, and those are the people oftentimes that aren't looking at the evidence. Right. Right. They're they're looking selectively at the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. really, really interesting. I just listened to a, a great audio book called Quantum Spirituality, Ooh. and it really blew my mind. Uh, a lot of books blow my mind, you know, fair enough. But uh, in this one, it talks about how the rationalists, like Richard Dawkins, for example, um, will... He's looking at, like, okay, Darwin says this, and anybody who doesn't believe in what Darwin says is is full of crap. However, Dawkins doesn't really take everything that Darwin said <laughs> into account, <laughs> so it's really interesting. It's funny how uh, we will always create something to fit our own narrative, you know, like, we believe it so much, we're looking for con confirmation bias uh, by taking selective bits out of everything. So I think that's how humans work. We just like, we create this sort of dynamic for ourselves where this is the way life is and we will, we're only really able to see things that don't challenge that. And and I think too on on that same wavelength is that 
people receive and can see what they're ready to see. Mm -hmm. You know, and we see that throughout the, the paranormal side of this all the time, where people who typically are, you know, complete staunch non-believers don't ever have experiences. Right. Um, so I think there's that angle, too, where we are manifesting and creating our belief system in front of us, which adds to the evidence that this thing does or doesn't exist. Yeah. So that's part of it, you know, and and I mean, I've been in terms of Sasquatch, I've been in that physical camp as well, where yep. I I used to be the person that was absolutely adamant that, that this thing was 100 percent flesh and blood and so on and so forth. But again, I had to really rewrite this to see this on a spectrum where mm. we are all you know, part of that physical. Does that mean I'm not part spiritual, non-physical then if Sasquatch is only physical? Right. Like that doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I kind of have to balance that out. Like how, if if I believe this about one thing, then how is that reflecting on my beliefs about myself? Well, that doesn't add up. So, you know, I, I, I think we have to, you know, give Bigfoot a little bit more credit in terms of, you know, it's its own sense of spirituality too. It was a French philosopher, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, I, I hope I'm not butchering his name too badly, who said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Yeah. I, lo I always dig that. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic. And it's and I think it, it is it is true for you know us for animals for you know everything that we're encountering mm -hmm. in this world. Um, I think it's it's this expression of of the universe, you know, whatever that is or looks like. And if we can take that view on it, I think thing a lot a lot of things make a bit, a bit more sense, mm -hmm. and we can wrap our brains around it a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit, just yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. That means being comfortable saying, I don't know. A lot of people are not comfortable with that. <laughs> exactly. That's, I think, where people are get hung up, yeah. is it's not fun to not know sometimes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So I think if that's the case, then, um, you know, we're, we, we really do have to, to think about that and, and be okay with the uh, being an unstable being in an unstable world. Well, I'm I'm definitely unstable. Aren't we all? <laughs> a little bit. So with that, thank you for joining us on this eerie expedition, dear listeners. And remember, the line between the natural and the supernatural is often a thin one. Until next time, stay curious, friends. Supernatural Circumstances is a co-production of Entity Seeker Paranormal Research and Teachings and Good Egg Studios. This podcast is part of the Curious Cast Podcast Network. Theme music by Corey Johnson of Catalyst Records in Edmonton, Alberta. You can learn more about Morgan Knudsen at EntitySeeker.ca and learn more about me, Mike Brown, and listen to my show, Dark Poutine, at DarkPoutine.com. Feel free to email the show at SupernaturalCircumstances at gmail.com.